morning. Good morning and welcome to First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville. My name is Jay Tiefenbrunn and I'm very pleased to be your director of music ministries. I'd like to invite you to join in singing this morning with hymn number 52 in Sweet Fields of Autumn, hymn number 52. Please rise in body or in spirit and join in the singing, number 52, in Sweet Fields of Autumn.
We light our chalice as a symbol of gratitude as we celebrate the abundance of our lives together. In this sanctuary, we harvest bushels of strength for one another and offer our cross with the hands of compassion and generosity. In the authentic and gentle manner of our connection, we cultivate a simple sweetness to brighten our spirits. May we be grateful for the ways we nourish and uplift each other, for it is the sharing of this hallowed time together that sustains us. I'd like to welcome you to this Sunday, which in Universalist tradition is All Saints Day, the first Sunday in November, because everyone, when they die, is a saint, because we're all in it together. So I'd like to you to join your hearts and minds in the spirit of worship with these words by Molly Hosh Gordon. Mysterious source of love moving within and between and among us, upholding and connecting all, the living, the dead, and the generations yet to come. We give thanks for the web of creation, strands interwoven, and for the gifts of love, which can never be ungiven or unraveled. morning. My name is Lori Stevens, and uh, I am mixed race, and so I combine this story out of a few different myths, and I hope to do all their storytellers honor in sharing it with you. Once upon a time, there was nothing, and there was no time also, so it was just darkness and swirling heat. There was no people, there was no animals, there was no earth. 
And out of all of this popped Kilatsli. And her name means the one who arrives on the sweet grass. And she stepped onto the shore of a river. And as she did so, the shore and the river and Kilatsli herself all came into being at the same time. She was very proud of herself. She was admiring her handiwork for a while, but it was still kind of dark, and she was all by herself. And so she decided to make someone to be with her. And she made a son who she called Mijo, which, if y'all know, Mexican moms often call their sons Mijo, which means my sweet boy, you know, very affectionate. And Mijo and Kilatsli were traveling along the river together, imagining new trees and new animals. Uh, they especially had fun coming up with the llama. That was a goofy one that they were pretty proud of. Um, but when they got to, they, they were thinking up a very important kind of food called maize, which is corn. We call it corn. And they couldn't decide what color it should be. Kilatsi was like, yellow. And Miho was like, no, red. And Kilatsi was like, what about blue? And they couldn't decide. They just kept popping the corn back and forth until it was changing colors. And then it just became all speckled and mixed and yellow and red and blue. And they got so mad at each other, and they, neither one would apologize. And so while they were fighting, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't come to the end of the fight, and so the river split. And Miho went down one stream of the river, and Kilatsli went down the other stream of the river. And after a while, Kilatsli's anger faded, and she really missed Miho. She was like, oh, I can't believe I let my anger just separate me from my sweet boy. So she turns around, she tries to go back up the river, but she can't do it, the current is too strong. And she's so sad. She's so sad she realizes she may have lost him forever. Have you guys ever felt so sad that you just wanna, you just wanna wail? You just wanna let out a big, Aah! Well, Kilatsli did this. And it was so big. It was as big as if all of us did it together, so why don't we give it a try? Try to think of one time when you were so sad and so lost that you just, it, it came out of deep inside you and you just had to let it out. So we're all gonna do it together on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Oh! oh, that was so good. It was just as big as that when Kilatsli did it. And it changed all the colors of the leaves and knocked them from the trees. She was that sad. Oh, <laughs> she was that sad. <laughs> and she was so sad for so long. She was floating down the river, and there were no leaves on the trees. But her hand was still in the river and kind of splashing around. And she realized that Miho was still part of the same river that she was in, and that even if he wasn't with her, they were still connected. So she, she tried to remember what it felt like before their fight and how much she loved him. And she tried to send that love back up the river, back down the, his side to him. And she's a goddess of creation, so she can do it. And so the love goes up, and it goes back down. And when it gets to him, it transforms him. He feels all tingly. And it transforms him into the god of stars named Mihuatl. And Mihuatl jumped out of the river, and he took some of it with him, and into the sky. And when Kilatsi looked up into the darkness, it wasn't dark anymore. She saw this big river of stars that we call the Milky Way. And she knew it was him, and she was so happy to see him, even though they couldn't be close together. And her love and her joy caused the spring to blossom for the very first time. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, our young people to go to church school. We'll sing them out with the song on the inside back cover of the gray hymnal.
Good morning. My name is Elaine Bailey Freed, and I am co chair of the worship committee here at our church. And it's my pleasure to welcome those in the sanctuary and th those joining us online to worship this morning. In order to reach a wider community than those able to be physically present on Sunday morning, our services are live streamed on YouTube and Facebook. Joys and concerns are not live streamed or recorded. Before I continue, let me, me remind you to silence your cell phones. As Unitarian Universalists, our spiritual paths vary, but in this congregation, we have made a covenant together. We affirm our interdependence, celebrate our differences, and work for justice. We deepen our relationships as we create a compassionate, welcoming community, nurture spiritual growth, and act on our values in the broader world. I want to extend a special welcome to visitors worshiping with us this morning. We ask you to wear the paper name tags because it helps us recognize you as someone we'd like to meet. If you are seeking a spiritual home, we hope that you may find it with us here. Whether you're new to Unitarian Universalism or visiting from another UU congregation, we invite you to stop by the welcome table after the service to have questions answered. People become members of this congregation by signing the membership book and supporting the church with their time and finances. If you're considering joining the church, please talk to our assistant minister, Denise Gouch. Following the service, we hope that everyone will enjoy coffee and fellowship in the social area at the top of the stairs, where you'll also find information about current opportunities for engagement and reflection. There are a number of announcements in the weekly bulletin, which I hope you'll read, and I have a few more. To speak, to speak and teach truth, to move people to act, this is how Brittany Packnett described her life's mission in the 2008 Ware Lecture delivered this summer at our General Assembly. Described as an unapologetic educator, organizer, writer, and speaker, Packnett fired up the crowd in Kansas City, challenging her audience to look beyond the comforts of privilege and work to change the world. The beloved community committee would like to invite you to a viewing and discussion of her passionate speech this morning at 10.30 a.m. right after this service in the Fireside Room. If you've already watched it, you can arrive at 11.15 as we gather to discuss what questions PACNET raises for us and how we might act on her ideas. Last Sunday, we heard from our NOAA community organizer, Nashville Organized for Action and Hope, uh, Alexandria Sparks. She told us about her important work in the community, including her work with young people. To support this vital position, NOAA is holding its annual fundraising reception on Sunday evening, November 18th. That's two weeks from now. A generous donor matches all the donations NOAA raises. Please stop by the social justice table after the service in the social hall to learn more about the event and consider making a donation of any size. And finally, thank you to each donor, volunteer, bidder, and participant who helped make the auction successful and gross about $25,000 last night. <laughs> There are some remaining items that will be available in the future, just not today. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I invite you now to finish arriving here in this sanctuary, to feel yourself part of this gathered community Perhaps take a deep breath or two, feel your body settle into the pew. And as you do so, you may become aware of events in your life, things that have happened in the last hours or days, the last week, that have struck you deeply. Things that are joyful, things that bring sorrow and concern. And if you would like to make any of those profound joys or sorrows present here in the community, you're invited to come forward. Our lay minister, Gloria Ballard, will help you select a stone and drop it in the bowl of water. 
And uh, if you would like those joys or concerns to be voiced here in the sanctuary, we invite you to fill out one of the small yellow slips of paper you can find in the pew right in front of you. And Gloria and I will read them to the congregation. and for all the joys and concerns that lie on our hearts unspoken as yet, let us join together in the spirit of prayer. Spirit of life and love and wisdom, we gather as a people. Our forebears spiritually are the universalists who taught us that love binds us all with each other and with the web of all existence and universalists like Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, we have a great deal more kindness than is ever spoken. And we gather with fear and concern and sorrow because so much unkindness is spoken these days. So many of us are afraid of being erased from social discourse, of being erased from the notice of those who care about how our, our society is built and run. We gather with anxiety around the elections and we gather knowing that we must learn to be even better at supporting each other, recognizing each other, seeing each other's full humanity. So let us be renewed today in the determination to speak a little more kindness to each other to watch for the people who help and speak kindness in the broader world, to support them in their attempts to do and build good and loving institutions in our communities and nations. May we always remember 
that we can gather with each other for support and strength and to experience a little of the love that we know we need to work to build in the world around us. May we know always that we are held by deep, deep, enduring connections of love. And may we continue to do our work in the world around us to build those so that others may know them too. Amen. May it be so. May we be so. We have come to the time in the service when our offering will be accepted with gratitude. Before the ushers come forward to collect that offering, I want, to know, I want you to know two things. One, you have the option, whether you're here in the pews today or joining us live, to uh, donate electronically. You can find a little bit more information about how to do that in your order of service, or if you're at home, you can always find instructions for donating at our website, the fun, T H E F U U N dot org. And the second thing is that each month we share a part of our offering plate with an organization that is furthering our mission, our values in the world, in the broader community around us. November's organization with whom we are sharing is actually our own prison ministry connected with this congregation. You can read a little bit more about them in the order of service, but we are very lucky this morning because Kimberly Bidwell, who represents Sanctuary of Light, which is our uh, CUPS, Covenant of UU Peglin's chapter, who is very active in the prison ministry. CUPS is very active in the prison ministry. And Kimberly is going to tell us a little bit more about their work. As always, your gratitude is received. No, your generosity is received with gratitude. Hi, I don't think I need to introduce myself again, but I will. My name's Kimberly Bidwell. I have <clears throat> worked with Funds Ministries for quite a while now. I was incarcerated for almost 20 years in the Tennessee Prison for Women in Nashville. During that time of incarceration, I was persecuted for my faith. Inmates and officers destroyed various personal religious items several times. I also spent a lot of time in segregation. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's time away from the general population. It's like jail within jail. Because of correction officers had actually classified me as a part of the security threat group because of my faith. The whole time, which would be between six and eight years, I was fighting for my rights. Once it was established that I was not backing down from my beliefs or the items I needed to worship, I was finally giving a hearing. Yes, this was just like a court hearing. <clears throat> I was able to show each of the items that I had created myself and what their purposes were and what they were used for. I even had to explain symbolism and colors. I did all of this in front of several corrections officers, security threat group officers, and even the wardens. I had shown proof that the US government agrees that paganism, Wicca, and witchcraft are legally founded religions. I stood strong, gave them everything they asked for, and answered all of their questions. I was finally able to get permission to practice my faith in my cell only and alone. I continued to fight for these religious freedoms. One day, this man was walking around and he had a flyer and he was having everybody fill out the flyer. And it was a questionnaire about religious services. And of course, me being the fighter that I am, <laughs> I filled it out gladly. Um, told them, there's nothing here for pagans. We cannot practice, we cannot do anything. The gentleman came up to me later after reading what I had wrote and made some suggestions. He said, go to the head chaplain of the Tennessee Prison for Women and request a chaplain of your own faith. This is the only way they have to provide your faith to you. I chose the UU Church because I was already a member of CUPS, which is the Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans, I joined them via mail while I was incarcerated. The head chaplain, although a very mainstream religious conservative, 
had no choice but to contact the director of religious director of religious services of Tennessee Department of Corrections for help to find a priestess. By the way, that was Ron Turner, a member here of the First UU Church of Nashville. He contacted priestess Edie White and let her know that I chose her as my chaplain. However, that really didn't get her in to see me. We had many male back and forth conversations. I was overjoyed that I had made this tiny bit of progress. Eventually, I was allowed to have visitation with her in what's called a one-on-one -on -one visit. We were watched by the correction officers the entire time. Here, I'd like to give you a little idea of what that was like. One time, we were told that we could only meet in the mess hall, which meant that Edie and I, Priestess Edie and I sat down to have our services and to have our meetings amongst the noise of pots and pans, the chatter of other inmates, correctional officers watching us, and at no point did we actually get to hear each other speak except for the peeking around the corners of people who were watching us. One day, we were talking and we started talking about people who were like me, who were also there in the prison system. They needed a priestess as well. I spread the word to the others to request them as her chaplain as well. After there were a few of us, the prison finally allowed us to start having meetings, of course, monitored. So we all went on a regular basis. We worshiped, celebrated, and rejoiced. Our coven is lovingly called the Sanctuary of Light of TPFW. We worked very hard and studied very hard to receive our personal religious items starting with our very first pentacle rings. I'm very proud and humble that my struggle helped create the freedom for all pagans in the Tennessee prison systems. Working with the prison ministry of this church through Sanctuary of Light has been a joy for me and helped me become the person I am today. I am currently writing a book for incarcerated pagans to teach them how to practice and worship in a minimalist lifestyle and stay within the regulations of the Department of Corrections. My words today are in the About Author section in my book for the Incarcerated Pagan. It's soon to be published, it has not been published yet. I have an online working coven where I teach. And right now, I'm starting a new business venture and book called Pagan Camping, Living the Dream. I camp 24 seven, all year long, I love it. I have no idea where I would be today had this struggle not happened and gave me the freedom to practice this religion of mine. If any of this had not come to fruition, I could not be standing before you today. The person I was before this did not have the nerve to stand here today. <clears throat> the prison ministry of this church through Sanctuary of Light and Priestess Edie White helped me in ways I can't even begin to express. I am available after the service for meet and greet. Um, please stop by, I'll answer any questions you may have. You'll find me near the social justice table. But before I leave, I want to share one more thing. I found out from Edie just the other day that I wasn't aware. We've been going for 12 years now. The recidivism rate for TPW and for the 12 years we've been practicing is at absolute zero none of our women have returned. Thank you.
just a little before All Saints Day last year, uh, one of the friends of our church, Don Coburn, died after a long illness. He was very elderly. And his memorial service, which was a little after that this holiday, um, his grown children stood up front at the end, and they lit a candle. And they said, Don passed on, quite literally to us, this, uh, the spark of life. And uh, now that he's dead, we want to pass it on to every single one of you. And they did a little ceremony that was much like what we do on Christmas Eve, where everybody had a taper, and they passed around his candle and lit their own. But that's symbolically what we all do here after someone dies. We think about those things that we want to keep burning alive in our lives, in our actions, in our thoughts, and keep them alive through us. Well, Don, it was clear, as he was a very... Um, uh, he'd lived a long, very fruitful life. He had many honors. He, had, he was an ordained Methodist minister who taught psychology in a university for many years. He had many students. But what he passed on to every single person in that crowded room was what he thought was at the heart and soul of all of religion psychology, which was one-on-one, -on -one personal relationships of kindness. And it was a very diverse group of people in there with many different beliefs. Every single one of them had learned to look beyond their beliefs or their opinions and be kind with one another. And so they took that spark with them out of that room and tried to live that in this last year. Now, he uh, was born on April Fool's Day, um, and he would tell jokes to explain that this kind of practice, this religious practice of his, of just kindness, was a part of a bigger understanding. And of course, he explained that with a joke, which many of you probably know. It's, what did the Zen Buddhist order at the hot dog stand? Does anybody know? One with everything. <laughs> so those personal relationships were an expression to him of that we are all one with everything. Well, soon after um, Don passed, another member of our church passed. And that was, am I, I know, oh, Jean Thomason. Now, Jean Thomason, like Don, had moved here to be close to his grown, her grown children, Phil, who's here today, who uh, grew up in the Bowling Green Church because Jean and her husband were the founding members of that church. And what I found out about Jean over the years that she was here, that she was born during the Depression, on a, her parents were sharecroppers on a farm in Georgia, and that she was the middle-ish child, nobody was quite sure how to count it, of 11 children. And if anybody would say, oh, it sounds like you grew up poor, she said, no, we were rich, rich in love. And what I learned from Jean, from her amazing fire, was that indeed you could have it all. Now, when I was young, we were taught that a woman could only be um, a person who was out in the world, a public person who had a job, or they had a private life, a family, and you had to choose. But she was totally, she never heard that. She just thought that was ridiculous. So when she was 16 and got her first job, 
that love that she felt gave her an enormous self-respect. And her boss in this office um, used foul language. What she went to him in his office, a 16-year-old, to the boss, and she says, you know, I did not grow up with that kind of language, and I am not going to work here if it continues. She walked out, and it stopped. He did not curse anymore at work. She went on to become a leading businesswoman in her community, the first woman realtor in Bowling Green who was much admired for her career. At the same time, because she believed that you do not hoard love, you do not hoard love, she had a loving marriage for 62 years to Max, raised four children, and just think with 10 brothers and sisters how many nephews and nieces she had. So she, all, she just poured on the love on all of her nephews and nieces, her, her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren. There was always more love to give. And she always understood for all her strength of opinions and who she was, for all of her love of family and community and church, that her larger goal was to serve the common good. So I'd like to light a candle for that strength of love that Jean passed on to so many people here in her family and in Bowling Green. Well, no one, we didn't have any members die until then, after that, till the spring. And then the spring, Sheldon Rosenberg passed away. And Sheldon had, like the two people before him, moved to this area to be near a grown child. When he was much younger, he grew up in a rapidly growing suburban area, very baby boomer child. And... Um, he did not have any burning passions. He went to work, he did his job, he um, had some interests, he was really interested in radio, which his son has said is what got him into the music business. He was really interested in travel and uh, maps, but they weren't burning. But what he did have was this grounded, grounded, steady heart. And I, I, I thought of him as more of a steady glow of love that he felt for his family and his cats. He was ill the last few years of his life and they sat, those three cats sat on his lap all that time and they took care of each other. And he did have one kind of flare of that love in the last year of his life. Was it a year or two? If his family had a secret. When he and his wife were dating, and this was in the 60s, they, she actually got pregnant. And her family kind of whisked her away and hid her and took that baby and put it up for adoption, as some families still did in those days. And later they got married. And every once in a while, they would try to find that child. And just before his final illness, they, he, they reconnected because he started looking for them. And they were so happy to find out he'd had a loving parents, a good life, and they got to know each other, which was a joy in Sheldon's final years. So I'd like to light this candle of steady, steady joy of a heart loyal. Sheldon also was always loyal to his Jewish roots. He was not practicing religiously. He came here to this congregation, but he certainly was loyal to his family and to his, the Jewish people. I think it was the larger thing that held him um, throughout his life. Well, soon after that, 
One of what I think of, you see these candles, you can some, they're called pillar candles, right? Well, in churches, we often say there's pillars of the church. And that next person who died was Virginia Grantham, who at the age of 97 had been, an adult, had been a member of this church for her whole adult life. So figure 60 some odd years, she had brought up her children here. Um, and she had actually brought up generations of children here because she was uh, considered, as a volunteer, the preschool children's religious educator for generations. And not only was she an advocate both here and in the community as a social worker for children and families, she um, mentored children and families here, both religious educators, volunteer, and um, professional, as well as their parents. One, uh, one person who's here told me that uh, she, uh, Virginia always had a big family dinner on Sunday afternoons, and as the children grew up and left, you know, they all, everybody knew they could bring anybody they wanted and come back, and it kept that family strong through the years, and they started doing the same thing. It was that kind of example she set. She had a strong marriage for many, you know, for a, for a lifetime with Dewey, uh, who, and they were both very active in the civil rights movement. If you go into the um, civil rights room at the downtown public library in Nashville, it has got the Dewey Grantham collection there, um, big sign. So they were very active in the community. Um, but in, on the other side, she wanted to minister to our elders. So she started our caring committee, of which somebody wrote a candle. Sarah wrote a candle about what a great job they did while she was um, recovering from her operation. And one of the things that Virginia started was this tradition of, they, the caring committee still does it, they put together bags, holiday bags, in the spring holiday and for the winter holidays, and they bring them to all the shut-ins. Well, about it was 14, 13 years ago now, she had a stroke, and boy, did she love that the caring committee came and brought her those bags every year. And it was, um, uh, it was fair. Well, we're never going to forget Virginia because uh, many of you know we give the Virginia Grantham Volunteer Award every year to sometimes one, two, or three exemplary volunteers get it. Um, people want to keep her generosity to church and community and families alive for the legacy. It's really a legacy in this church. And finally, just last month, a much younger person died here in the congregation, Rebecca Bell. Um, she came here younger, younger than Virginia. Uh, Rebecca came here as a young woman, just like Virginia did, with little children that she wanted to bring up in this congregation where there were people of light values. Now, she was a nurse. She was, uh, for many years, the, um, uh, a nurse at the uh, neonatal intensive care unit where many, many babies died or there were stillborn babies. She worked with very high-risk mothers. And the thing that I learned about Rebecca as we saw her children grow up here was that she faced all of life, both the joy, the playfulness, and the pain fully. She was fully present to it. So it's not surprising, for instance, that uh, she was very playful with all the kids as they grew up and the teenagers, they were always doing costumes. But she also taught, um, in those days it was called about our sexuality. You know, she was a real scientist and she knew how to do that. And then all the parents of that cohort, which I see happening all the time here, became really good friends and brought those children up together. So those um, children at that age became friends. So when she got this final illness, which took her very quickly, and we had this memorial service, her 
two daughters in their early 20s were there surrounded by people who had grown up with them in this church. Some of them flew from Colorado and different parts of the country to be with her and their parents, all to support one another. Those girls were not alone in their grief. But there were also, you know, like a whole bank of nurses from Vanderbilt there. And they were there because Rebecca started a program in the NICU, in the intensive care unit, for parents who lost their children, either had stillbirths or their baby died while they were still there. And she developed this whole program so that the parents could grieve and remember. And even though she decided just the last few years to work in a different unit, she was going, went over there several times a year to make sure the nurses over in the queue were still uh, ministering, really ministering to those grieving parents. Um, I'd like to light this candle for, um, the, for Rebecca Bell, who leaves us with the example of living a fully vital life totally present to all that life has to offer. And as we move on in this service and think about all the people we've lost and loved, may we remember that they have passed, as these people have, the spark, the flame of their lives onto us, which mingle with the flames of ours, and we carry them forward until it is time for us to pass them on in our time. May it be so. I'd like to invite you to rise in body or in spirit as you're so moved and join me in singing number 1002, Comfort Me in the Turquoise Hymnal, number 1002. I'll line out the words as we go.
are connected to those we have loved and lost through memory. And few memories are stronger than sense memories. Uh, I have a quick confession. Everything I know about Dia de los Muertos, Google has taught me. Uh, my Mexican family is from Detroit, and we were pretty disconnected from our ancestral memories. But I have a very vivid memory of my own grandmother, my abuela. She and I, when I was little, on this one morning, happened to have woken up earlier than anyone else in the house. We talked and cuddled. She had tons of grandchildren, big Mexican family, and so it was really special to get this individual attention. And she took her finger and she traced it in circles around my face. And this glowing moment with the bright, quiet dawn coming through the windows and her soft finger centering me and myself stays with me. It is a sacred memory. I'd like to ask you to bring yourself more fully to this sacred space. Feel the surface underneath you, and if you'd like, close your eyes. Now, call to mind the smells, tastes, sounds, and touch of special loved ones who have died. The smell of their favorite holiday dish, the sound of them singing a lullaby. Perhaps there are some difficult memories too. All of these can be honored, held lightly, or let go. What do these memories of love, comfort, or sadness call us to now? Who in our lives can we love or comfort? And who can we spare the same sadness? What future can the past inspire?
this time, you may notice that there are candles set up all over <laughs> this sanctuary. There's um, some back there by that door. There's a couple stations set up in the back where Reverend Denise is, and there's some here. There's a few here. Um, we will have people there to help you if you would like to go and light a candle in memory of any of the people that you're carrying in your heart today who have passed. If you'd like to say their name out loud, of course, you're invited to do so. May we at this time remember the light that people have passed on to us. Tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch. A fearful thing to love, to hope, to dream, to be. To be an O oh, to lose. A thing for fools, this, and a holy thing, a holy thing to love. For your life has lived in me. Your laugh once lifted me. Your word was gift to me. To remember this brings painful joy. Tis a human thing, love, a holy thing to love what death has touched. It is so. spirit if you are so moved and join in singing hymn number 324 where my free spirit onwards leads hymn number 324 
those buttons. Please join me in your chalice extinguishing the words are found at the bottom of your order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And I'd like to close with these words by Lee Hubert. Lighting a candle is somewhat like the beginning of life. If that is true, then perhaps extinguishing a candle is like the ending of life. But death may not be the end of us. We live on in the memories of friends and loved ones. This influence we possessed in life works on, moving persons or causes forward. Let us not forget that most candles have more than one life, and so perhaps may we. This service is over. Let our service begin again, renewed.